Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, please press star 1. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now we'll turn the meeting over to Mr. True Softwind. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Sarah. So, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Charles Hoffwind, and welcome back to, to those of you who attended our first uh, version 11 webinar yesterday. We could probably easily fill several webinars talking about the new uh, V11 release, um, but really one of the key themes of version 11 is, is security, and, and more specifically, protection against uh, multi-layer attacks. So we will cover this, and um, we're also going to talk about dynamic access control for applications as well as DNS security and DDoS mitigation. So to talk about this, with me today I have our speaker, Peter Silva, who is a um, technical marketing manager and a security expert. Peter has been with, uh, with the company since 2004, he's very experienced and he will be happy to take your questions at the end. Um, please go ahead and use the, 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 the chat Q&A feature if you like, uh, and at the end we'll open, up, open it up for other questions as well. So enough said, let me hand it over to Peter. Peter, please go ahead. Oh, thanks, Jules. And good afternoon to everyone. It's actually a uh, good morning for me. I'm out here uh, in California. It's 7 a.m. And, uh, but I've had my coffee and I've been up for a little while, so should be fine. But I'll probably be yawning at 2.30 my time today. So thanks again for joining. It's, um, we're going to go over the dynamic attack protection and access control in Big IP version 11. So let's dig right in. Over the decades, data centers started out simple, but as more and more siloed services were implemented, application and security infrastructure issues have been a major factor in businesses' inability to adequately scale and protect themselves. So in the traditional IT model, resources, users, and access methods were controlled by IT. The relationships among users, applications, and data were very static and tightly bound, and even applications were written with specific uh, display layouts in mind. But then as remote and then mobile users were added, along with partners and contractors and guests, and as IT was distributed globally, that traditional model broke down. You can't just do the one-to-one -one anymore. So in today's complex IT security world, it's not enough for an organization to simply know who is accessing their data and applications. They must also know things like what device, what type of network, which resources the users are requesting, and it's also critical to know whether those requested servers, networks, and applications are available and secure. Ultimately, the static data center with static security infrastructure is unable to adequately handle the challenges of the current IT reality. And, you know, it used to be simple. It was designed to deliver a relatively small set of services with one generic user type, but that grew more complicated and the design got more complicated with multiple users and multiple device types and the additional services. Obviously, it wouldn't uh, facilitate the needs. And then complexity is, of course, the enemy of good security. This actually was a quote from about 15 years ago. Uh, Bruce Schneider, who's a security expert, said this about uh, operating systems and um, you know, desktops and such servers back like 15 years ago, and it's interesting how it's kind of held the test of time. We also, as human beings, often will forego some security for convenience. It's kind of how we operate sometimes. You know, oh, yeah, if somebody asks your phone number and address without anything, you might be cautious about turning that personal information over, but if they say, oh, you know, we'll give you a coupon for something, then more often than not, we may take that and give up our personal information. And so today, IT departments require control points that can adapt dynamically for the secure content and applications that they are, because they're delivered from a variety of locations to a multitude of users. 
And this is especially true for global infrastructures that span the cloud and the data center. So, you know, many users are on the move and they're accessing applications and content that may be on the move as well. It's no longer going to that um, one data center in one location. Potentially, it might be hitting that data center in the morning, but then as more and more users come on come on to the network and access applications, some of those applications may be moved to the cloud potentially for a bursting scenario or capacity planning or those disaster recovery. And so even the applications themselves, it might even be geolocation depending upon where the user is requesting access from, might determine that, you know, the main data center is not the best place to deliver that content. You might route them to a closer data center. So a central policy control point is critical to managing these dynamic environments because when a control point is decentralized, IT has limited control over the flow of data. And that means that there is no contextual information with which to make intelligent decisions. And that change control becomes difficult, error prone. It removes simplicity, flexibility, and all those things needed for global access deployments. And I'll talk a little bit about it in the coming slides, but what is context? Context just means the user, the device, the network they're on, the group that they're in, um, whether they're coming from a trusted or untrusted device. All of this, all these pieces of metadata or contextual information to then be able to make that intelligent decision right there on the fly of how best to then deliver that content to the end user. If you think about the flow of anything, cars, water, electricity, commerce, there are always these strategic points of control within those flows where all the flows come together, coalesce for redistribution, security, load balancing, those type of functions. You think of a stop sign for a two-lane road or even an electrical system, an air conditioning system for a huge high-rise, a big building. They all come back to a central control point. That's where the big IP devices sit in the data center, in that strategic point of control where all the flows come together from the users and then back into the, back to the applications and making those intelligent decisions right there on the fly. In an F5 powered dynamic data center, this means IT can manage the network as a pool of resources, reusable resources, so not just the one-to-one -one static. And they, these resources can be configured and reconfigured dynamically. That those uh, those static points uh, rarely hold up when um, you know when people start moving. When it becomes much more dynamic, when the mapping is not one to one anymore. And so, with Big IP version 11, there are a number of dynamic attack protections and access control features that help IT departments deal with such things as Web 2.0 applications, the unified access control, whether it be remote access, wireless, network, you know, LAN access, the whole NAC um, piece of it, and then, of course, DNS. So, you know, DNS is where it begins and ends. I mean, that when you type in a URL, it's DNS that gets you where you need to get to. And so when we talk about adaptive protection for Web 2.0 applications, so you have to be dynamic in your protection because the threats out there are dynamic themselves. The threats are evolving, and so protection needs to be – protection also needs to evolve. And so you can see here distributed denial of service attacks. These are, you know, constantly hitting customers, um, everybody out there on a daily basis. And when we talk about how these are, are layered attacks and why you need layered security is that often these attacks will start at the network layer. They'll start, you know, bombarding the network, and everybody's attention goes to protecting the network, and then all of a sudden, once that network is saturated, they then move to the application layer, layer 7, and start attacking the application. And so, but, the, you know, the thing about it is that things like denial of service attacks, and even, you know, we see often um, SQL injections, a lot of breaches begin with a SQL injection. It's that we've known about these attacks, particularly SQL injection, for like 10, 12 years. So a lot of these attacks that we see in the media today are absolutely preventable. Even if you go back a couple of years, 
the breach for Heartland Payment Systems, the Target breach where they, you know, stole the credit card information over the wire, that would have been prevented had that information simply been encrypted. And today, you know, network firewalls are simply not enough. They might not handle the load for a denial of service attack. Uh, IPS systems might not have signatures for the current uh, attack modes out there, or there might be a zero-day attack that nobody knows about. And most of these network firewalls, obviously, are blind to Layer 7. They, you know, HTTP and HTTPS comes in. Now, they might, there may be a, um, this might be a, a hack through a browser, but because a network firewall sees, you know, port 80 and port, port 443, it says, come on in, have a good time, have at it. And so you definitely need that layered uh, protection and application protection that that actually that actually that obviously F5 provides. And so these types of you know anonymous attacks and it, you know you think about this hacktivism stuff and it's interesting you know back in the day people used to you know picket people used to write letters to complain people used to um, you know boycott products and, and it's this new kind of hacktivism is just I think of it as the um, evolution of the internet you know instead of you know picketing throwing rocks now these these hacktivists if you will attack websites and, and essentially instead of having to you know sign petitions you basically the entire site gets boycotted and so because of these you know multiple layers um, you might not realize it, but LTM can mitigate against many network-based uh, attacks. For instance, that distributed denial of service attack. And then, of course, Big IP Application Security Manager, our web application firewall, will mitigate against the Layer 7 distributed denial of service attacks. And so they don't – so, you know, that melting of uh, – you can see the little red melting of the firewall wouldn't occur with an F5 device in place. And you also have to obviously disperse, you know, I talked earlier about the fact that a lot of these applications and, and delivery of resources are coming from multiple data centers, potentially the main one, a branch one, the cloud. And so you being able to disperse your security around your infrastructure and having that same policy in place no matter where the applications are being delivered from is obviously critical. Now, you might have that proper policy and security in place locally, but what happens at these other, you know, locations? And so companies might have a hard time making sure that the protection out in the cloud is the same that they have in-house since, uh, you know, they might not have an option for a web application firewall. Big IP Application Security Manager in version 11 uh, is now offered in a virtual edition, and it's the exact same code that you find on the hardware appliance. You can do all of the protection that you need, the OWASP top 10, the PCI compliance, and the list goes on. But now being able to deploy a web application firewall virtually in your cloud environment becomes a reality. And so you can sync policies between devices. You might have uh, a particular policy set in your data center and then easily being able to sync that to the cloud when the cloud becomes live depending upon the scenario that it does. Again, it may be a bursting scenario. It might be a disaster recovery scenario. There may be a situation in the cloud where you find a new vulnerability or, or something else that's going on, and you're able to then import and, and sync back that new policy to your current policy in your main data center. And so it, it helps a lot along the way. It also helps the uh, development deploy uh, a web application firewall during the, the coding, development, and testing process. So what happens, you might develop an application, and it runs beautifully in the lab, but as soon as you put it live and put a, a WAF in front of it, all of these, you know, false positives, and it's not working, and how come I can't get to types of scenarios? But having that virtual addition during the development phase, then they can already tune the policy and know exactly how that application is going to behave when it goes live in the real world. Oh, uh, we got a little build here. And even, you know, it might be difficult to support these latest types of web deployment tools, such as uh, AJAX or uh, AJAX being carried over uh, JSON payloads. 
And the same kind of man in the middle attacks or um, being able to sniff out information over these methods of coding and delivery of applications can occur. So if uh, if uh, Ajax is insecure or or JSON is insecure, and you're sending uh, personal information, critical information, if it's not encrypted or secured, it can certainly then be lifted. And so here in this screenshot, you can see the S&P 500 is uh, out and available. And these are, you know, these, um, uh, you know, your customized websites where you log on with a username and password, and then you get your own customized information. So what Ajax allows is uh, the Ajax allows the delivery of content or updated changing content within that particular frame or um, piece of code without having to refresh the entire HTTP page. So it allows new content to be delivered without having to do the refresh or refresh the entire HTTP. And so um, what happens, we can, we can certainly secure the Ajax um, because it's the same attack vectors as, say, HTTP apps. But when you get a blocking message like this, the end user looks at it and goes, okay, what is that? With Big IP ASM, Application Security Manager in version 11, we are able to secure AJAX and these JSON payloads. Now, you might not be using AJAX now for development, but because it's an emerging technology, a lot of companies are jumping on this AJAX bandwagon simply for the fact of delivering those small little updates on a website, particularly for these personalized uh, websites. And so here you can see in the My Stock Portfolio, instead of having a bunch of garbly gook and the user doesn't know what's going on, in this scenario with ASM sitting in front of the application, there's actually then a message to the user letting him know that, oh, by the way, this request has violated our security policy and here's your support ID if you have any questions. Let us know. And so it informs everybody exactly what's going on rather than just displaying either nothing or garbly gook. Garbly gook. Oop, I think I missed a build right there. Oh, yeah. So obviously the, the application security manager protects both, you know, from the client, you know, trying to get to the application, but also, and, and very important, the application information on the way back out. With PCI, especially, you know, 6.6, um, uh, sometimes companies have, you can either, you know, to comply with PCI 6.6 6, 6 specifically, you can either choose a, a, a scanner, a web application scanner, a code scanner, or a web application firewall. And, and customers and companies sometimes are, are, well, what do I choose? Do I, you know, I can, I can choose this scanner and scan my code and find out what's wrong, but it's going to take time for me to fix this code. It's going to cost money to fix this code, and I'm still not protected, but at least I know what's going on. And then on the other side, the web application firewall, okay, great. You know, I'm, I'm protecting my, my application, and I got all this policy in place, and it blocks all the OWASP top ten, but I really don't know if my code is secure. I really don't know what's going on with my code. And so our integration with White Hat Security brings together the best of both worlds. It allows the White Hat uh, Sentinel scanner to scan your application and scan the code. And once it finds, whatever it finds, these vulnerabilities and, and breaks, fixes, whatever, you're then able to, like, simply, it's as easy as that, you know, the easy button, pressing a button, and the White Hat Sentinel will then uh, populate Big IP Application Security Manager with the new rules with an additional policy to then protect against those vulnerabilities that it's found. And it's what's called virtual patching. And so you find out what's wrong with the code, you virtually patch it so that you're protected from day one, which allows companies to then go back and fix whatever they need fixed uh, in time without keeping themselves vulnerable to breaches and, and other sorts of threats. So it's pretty darn cool. And it does it like lickety split. It's just okay, this is what we found, click the button, here's your new policy, check it out, and enable or just, you know, set it up to watch for a little while to make sure that there are no false positives, false negatives, and, and those other um, other things that you need to do to really uh, tweak and, and make that policy work for you. 
And so with version 11 of Big IP ASM, we can certainly secure the latest Web 2.0 applications and those custom applications that are being delivered to the end user. Uh, the VE is, you know, certainly available. It's a virtual and private cloud, but in the development process, in the testing lab, uh, the, the virtual clustered multiprocessing is really virtualization of our big IP devices. And what that means is the ability on, say, a Viprion chassis to have local traffic manager running on one blade, the application security manager running on another blade, and even parsing those pieces up for various groups or various departments or even various administrators. And obviously the high throughput and the enhanced management and reporting. I mean, it's great to you know, block everything, but unless you got those reports and the pretty graphs and everything else, not only for the executives, but also potentially the, uh, you know, auditors and regulators, well, you need that to also prove that you are protected and exactly what are you doing to keep that protection in place. So next, let's talk a little bit about advanced dynamic services for unified access control. You know, uh, when you say um, web application protection or securing web apps, it, it can mean, uh, or it's even just simply securing applications, it sort of means two things on both ends. One, on the one side, it, it, it means, you know, protecting your web application from malicious users, from hacks, breaches, uh, those sorts of things. And then on the other hand, it also means... Um, the end users requesting access to resources. Security is really not necessarily about keeping the bad guys out. I mean, yes, that's, you know, one of the criteria of security, keep the bad guys out. But it's really about allowing, allowing the validated users, the authenticated users in uh, to a specific set of resources at, you know, at the right time for the right reasons and all those sorts of things. So security is not is also about letting the good guys in based on certain policies, parameters, uh, along with, obviously, keeping the bad guys out. And so this problem of who, what, where, that's all that context that I was talking about earlier. Is it an employee? Is it a partner? Is it a contractor? I also sort of add this who, what, where, when, and why. Why are they potentially requesting this resource when they're not in the authorized group to see this. And even the when piece, it can be critical for partners and contractors. You might allow partners and contractors, and I believe I have a, a uh, slide coming up to show, you might allow pa partners and contractors network access or a layer three tunnel, a VPN connection from the hours of nine to five, because that's when they're on the clock, that's when you pay them. But at seven o'clock, they log in. Now, they're still a valid user, but you're not going to offer them a uh, network tunnel, you might just offer them a few web applications. And, and these are the type of questions, which applications, who, where did they navigate? A lot of times with uh, anonymous networks, you can still log on with username and ID, and it might grab your IP address, but that doesn't tell exactly who the user is and what are they requesting access, access to. And so access control must be based on context. All that context that you gather at the time of the request, taking all that information into consideration when making that decision. And context also has to do with, with um, authenticating or, or access based on identity, the identity of the user. And that includes, you know, a lot of deeper things. I, I talk about identity, you know, when I, when I speak about context and stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's, sometimes there's this image we project. You know, rock stars, movie stars, they, they project an image. They project a persona. That's what they want the public to think of them as. But their image and persona may be completely different than from their identity. Your identity is really who you are, your roots, uh, what do you love, what are your greatest fears. And I'm not saying, you know, take a little drop of blood to authenticate somebody. But it's really those little specific pieces of information about you that then make, you know, that context and have those intelligent decisions happen on the fly to then deliver the appropriate content to you. And you want to unify all access. It's not point solutions for wireless and for NAC and for remote access. You need to unify all of these solutions onto a single appliance. Um, you know, cons consolidation is, a, you know, one of those big trends these days. 
And, of course, the rest, the, you know, reporting the analytics. And so also in version 11, when it comes to access, we offer the Big IP Access Policy Manager. And this is a module. This is an add-on to Big IP Local Traffic Manager. You know, LTM is our, our bread and butter application delivery controller. And it, it, you know, load balances, it delivers applications, it does SSL offload, it does a whole bunch of stuff. You know, along the way, you know, Trul said, um, you've been here since 2004, then I've worked pretty much on our, you know, um, our security products from the, you know, access ones to the web application fire ones. And oftentimes we start conversations with, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if? And, you know, we're kind of familiar with SSL VPNs in terms of doing the uh, host checks. Do I have antivirus? Do I have firewall? Is everything... Is everything, you know, within the guidelines of the security policy to allow me gain access? And I always thought, wouldn't it be cool if that sort of little quick host check could happen before I visit my banking site, just on the public Internet? And so that's what APM actually allows, is allows companies now for banking sites, financial sites, any public-facing website, not just now your internal applications, to do this little security check along the way. It might be, Helping, helping individuals, just regular folk out there on the internet, start to kind of get a gleam of what security means. And oh, I don't, am I antivirus? What's antivirus? Um, have them now start to pay a little bit more attention to security, and so it, it offers that. It also offers remote access, SSL VPN. So now imagine being able to just have your end users, since since the big IP LTM is managing your infrastructure and your systems and your resources already and doing all that, oops, I think I, yeah, uh, already, why not also then, uh, you know, have end users potentially connect from remote access now? And, and, and it offers, you know, all the same features that a traditional SSL VPN offers, the Layer 3 tunnel, the reverse proxy for web applications, and then um, specific port mapping or application tunnels where it might just be that, Outlook or, or a specific CRM application that you're not going to offer up an entire tunnel, but you are going to create a secure encrypted tunnel to that particular resource, to that, per, you know, particular file, to that particular subnet, because the internal network ain't the safe haven that it used to be. You know, on top of that, it's also these non-HTTP applications. So ActiveSync, I got a, I, uh, you know, I finally um, got a iPad and being able to do active sync with the F5 exchange system on this tablet is pretty darn cool. And then, you know, other pieces like Citrix. So also being able to control access, to manage access, to make those intelligent decisions, not only for, for, you know, HTTP apps, HTTPS apps, but also non HTTP apps. It also gives, you know, flexible and dynamic application delivery services. And so, you know, we've talked about this uh, having, a, having a distributed infrastructure, distributed global architecture, and, and you can have these various devices in your various data centers. One of the cool things about version 11 of Big IP is that we've added IPsec. So being able to create these optimized site-to-site -site tunnels between big IP devices. So even at the headquarters and remote offices, you have your edge gateway, your primary. You can, and, and then you also have data centers around the world or even a cloud uh, deployment, whether it be public, private, hybrid, doesn't matter. Being able to create, it, it's essentially creating a secure wide area network that's encrypted and optimized over, you know, the big bad public internet just by having two big IP devices on either end, and so you can realize that, you know, security, that encryption, that optimization throughout your entire infrastructure. Now, one of the things you'll notice, I don't I can't remember if it's on the next slide or not, is this, um, and I, I know we have a slide about it, is the Big IP Edge Gateway. So, you know, thus far I've talked about the Big IP Application Security Manager, the Web Application Firewall. I've spoken about the Big IP Access Policy Manager, which is that add-on module to local traffic manager. And now you can see in this slide the big IP edge gateway. That is our – so the APM on LTM, you know, that's that add-on to LTM. 
the Big IP Edge gateway is essentially your standalone uh, secure access solution. So if you're looking for you know standalone device rather than necessarily you know adding the APM module to LTM, Edge Gateway would be your choice. Now the one thing that the Edge Gateway adds that the LTM and APM combination doesn't have is included in the code is web acceleration and WAN optimization. And so the TCP optimizations and those particular pieces, and that might be critical for those individuals who are on mobile devices, maybe a 3G network, or maybe, you know, another type of network that might be latency sensitive. And so having that WAN optimization already built into Edge Gateway helps deliver those applications quickly to those, you know, specific end users who might be on less than stellar networks. So when a user does log on to whether it be the Access Policy Manager or the Edge Gateway, this is the their web top that they see. So once they log, once they get authenticated and then authorized to determine, you know, what they have access to, these may be the selections that they get uh, securely after that after logging in. And you can see on the top we got applications in like OWA, my Linux box, um, Citrix, an RDP connection. And then below that is my network access, that layer three uh, VPN tunnel. And earlier when I was talking about contractors, partners, uh, et cetera, so this might be the, the screen that that contractor or partner gets when he logs on between nine and five. Now, you know, after five o'clock, seven o'clock, he gets home, one o'clock in the morning, who knows, um, he logs in. Now, he's able to get in. We're not going to deny access depending on time, because he is a valid user. But once he logs in, maybe maybe that VPN connection is no longer available because it's outside the boundaries of the policy. He can still get to OWA. He might still be able to get to a CRM application or an HR application to enter the hours and the work that he had done during the day. But, but the company is not going to allow him a direct connection to the network because he's not, you know, um, on those working hours. And so that's when we also talk about, you know, being very dynamic and, and policy driven and, and those sorts of things, along with taking in that context of the end user. Oh, he's a contractor. Oh, it's outside the time. Okay, you can come in. This time, you know, two hours later, this time, you only have access to these resources. It also integrates, it, managing in the uh, AAA infrastructure can be challenging, can be frustrating, can be expensive. And whether it be the LTM and APM, <coughs> um, sorry about that, excuse me, or the Edge Gateway, both of these devices, both of these solutions will integrate directly with <coughs> your current AAA infrastructure. We don't care it's, if it's Active Directory, LDAP, Radius, uh, Native Secure ID, just basic off, forms based. Any of those would just integrate right into your AAA infrastructure. You really don't need to change anything other than telling, you know, big IP where to look, where to point, and then being able to take that information both on, you know, the left side, but then also integrating with various pieces on the back end, say for Oracle Access Manager. You know, you need to authenticate to get to OAM, and sometimes that means putting in an entire proxy tier of our, of authentication proxies. Sometimes that means putting agents on the servers themselves and then having to update all those agents. Sometimes it means writing the authentication, writing the security into the code. And that doesn't always work. That can be expensive. <coughs> and so then being able to offload some of that type of functionality from, say, things like OAM onto the big IP device makes, you know, all that infrastructure systems, resources, application delivery work better. So we have, oops, let me see if I can get to the final build. This might be the one we were talking about, hey, tools. That, uh, so the new detail reporting in version 11 um, gives you built-in custom reports, and it's not, again, you know, I, I spoke earlier, it's, um, you can kind of set up your policy and, and create these applications, but unless you have the reporting to then make those intelligent decisions about growth, about scale, about how to distribute 
your resources effectively and efficiently. It's the reporting and the information that you then get from these solutions that help you make those intelligent business decisions other than, you know, the intelligent application delivery decision. So who is gaining access? And a lot of people, or a lot of, I should say, you know, reporting mechanisms um, only tell you about the, the back-end application itself. How is my infrastructure performing? Um, you know, what is the response time on these servers? Many of our reports, we're also very much interested in in the user experience. How is this being delivered all the way back down to the end user directly to their device? What is the client-side latency like? And you can see you have a number of fields, a number of choices to uh, select from to then determine what type of customized reports that you need for, you know, what you need. And you can see on this slide it also has, you know, the pretty graphs about what's going on, uh, client IPs, geolocation, user agents, and like I said earlier on the last slide, client-side latency to know exactly how that application is performing all the way back to the end user. Because that's really what it's about. It's about that end user experience. You can do all that WAN up and, and distributed applications and application delivery controllers and high-speed connections, you know, at the data center. But, you know, how, what is the end user experiencing all the way down back to that specific device? And you can group them out by app, by by user, by user group, however you want to slice and dice it. Our big IP Edge Gateway actually real recently within the last uh, month was named the Reader's Choice Award from Information Security Magazine. And so not only, I mean, yeah, I can sit here for, you know, another 20 minutes ranting and raving about, oh, it's beautiful, oh, I use it every day, it is, you know. But at now, um, well, not now, I mean, we always knew our customers liked it, but, you know, winning an award, a Reader's Choice Award such as this is was pretty cool for us. Gold, baby. And so a little bit of background about, um, you know, all this. The, the, you know, I kind of spoke a little bit about um, that, that consolidated access, that, you know, remote access, the, the wireless, local access, the, the NAC. You know, NAC used to be the biggest thing about four years ago, and it kind of just sort of dwindled away. But, but, you know, that, like I was mentioning earlier, the internal network is still uh, susceptible to breaches, is still susceptible to hacks. And there's certainly sensitive, critical information on that internal network that even internal employees should not have access to. They are not authorized to see, say, you know, financial information for, you know, an upcoming quarter. That's on the internal network. But, you know, I, you know, as just a, you know, regular employee shouldn't have access. I, I really don't want to have access to that, but shouldn't have access to that information. And so, why not even secure it on the inside while the CFO is requesting that file, even encrypt that file all the way back even though it's on the internal network? And so kind of the various solutions, LTM plus APM. There's also the ADC access control, which is your bundled. And then, as I mentioned a couple slides ago, the, the edge gateway, which includes the, you know, the APM along with those WAN optimization and web acceleration pieces. So it's really, it really depends. You know, which one I, should I choose? A lot of it depends on your deployment and and needs. So sort of, you know, not sort of, a lot of what we what we spoke about spoke about the IP SAC um, access and, and of course all of the dynamic um, access control lists and and bringing certain people down to certain areas within. The infrastructure, single sign-on is handled throughout the back-end infrastructure. Endpoint inspection, I you know, talked about that a little bit earlier. That's becoming even more critical. There used to be this notion, and I, even, I think I even mentioned it earlier, trusted versus untrusted, but really it's all about you know, nothing should be trusted anymore. No device, especially now as many, many more personal type of devices and the whole bring your own device to work um, scenarios start playing out. There will be no device that is trusted unless there is this inspection, this scrutiny that happens, whether it's a corporate-issued laptop or my own, you know, iPad sitting over here, that they both go through the same scrutiny before allowing access to critical, sensitive 
internal information. And then, of course, the scale for a global enterprise. The access policy manager, the the big IP edge gateway can scale to 60,000 concurrent users, uh, multi-gigabit throughput, and even 600 logons per second. Many devices can't even reach that arena, the 600. And so, you know, you see it sometimes. East Coast wakes up, everybody logs on, and then now, you know, the West Coast wakes up, everybody, every, they already got half the crew on. Now all of these new users jump on, and potentially there's some some slowness. There's not, you know, the, it might take a few seconds to log on, where with these sorts of appliances, controllers, devices, you know, it doesn't matter who wakes up when or if there's a snow day or, you know, a major disaster, everybody can get on when they need to get on. DNS, the domain name system, I mentioned right at the top that, that this is critical to the survival of the Internet. It is what resolves names to numbers. We created this system because humans have a hard time remembering number sequences, but we can remember, you know, words and sentences and, and those sorts of things a lot easier. But DNS is susceptible to attacks, and it can affect the entire you know, Internet or, or your entire infrastructure and can cost, you know, a lot of money in in, in that. And it's, like I said, critical. Um, and why do you go after DNS first? Because that's the name resolution. That's one of the ways that you can, you know, easily uh, create a denial of service attack. You know, forget about flooding with, you know, um, a whole bunch of bots, flooding the network, saturating the network, creating latency, taking down the servers on the back end. They're not responding. Just... Shoot, just start with DNS. Don't even let the name resolve. There's your denial of service attack. And we see that. This is from Forrester, I believe. Yeah, Forrester Consulting, that um, a lot of companies get DNS-based attacks quite often. And you can see the uh, statistics there. 51%, ha at least half, have seen, you know, one DNS attack over the last couple of years. And it costs money, you know. Not only um, costing money in terms of downtime, it's, it's something like, you know, a lot of companies, I saw a statistic recently that uh, that it's a lot of, you know, forget about e-commerce companies that rely 100% on their web property to make money, but even, you know, regular brick and mortar type outfits, type corporations, now, you know, anywhere from 25 to 35% of their revenue is coming from their online properties. And so, you know, that downtime can be a, a huge financial loss, even for your traditional uh, storefront-type properties that have, you know, their online uh, store going on. And it's also then the financial loss and the, the time it takes your IT administration to figure out what's going on, to fix the problem, to make everything back in working order again. So that, so that financial hit is both in terms of revenue, not people not getting to your site, but also in terms of the extra time it takes your IT staff to then fix the problem. Identify first, you know, identify it, and then fix it. And so, obviously, it's vulnerable to attacks to, um, you know, constantly, you know, attack the DNS so nobody else can resolve or do the man-in-the-middle attack type things where you, uh, you know, the, the uh, cash poisoning, sending somebody to a rogue server rather than the actual server that they requested. In version 11 for Big IP Global Traffic Manager, so that's our uh, local traffic manager handles, you know, locally within the data center where the global traffic manager is that device that, that intelligently distributes traffic around the world and knows what, what's going on in all of your various data centers to say, oh, you know, yeah, you're in New York, you should go to the New York data center, but the New York data center is having issues, let's send you to San Francisco. But DNS Express allows companies really to thwart a lot of these DNS-based attacks. And so it really just allows the legitimate queries, the legitimate users in while blocking the malicious users. And so really one of the metrics that, that you know, through testing and stuff, we came up with that it can increase your DNS responses by 10 times. Because even during a DNS attack, it's blocking those those bad requests and letting in the good requests. Uh, more than just blowing off your socks. That's kind of cool, Jules. Um, so the, the global traffic manager obviously needs to perform um, 
very well in a global distributed environment. And you can see here, even even our lower end, the 16, 1600, can do you know 300,000 queries per second. That's quite a bit. Um, getting up to the Viprion chassis to six million queries per second. And so high performance, high response times, and also when there is those peak loads and, and those attacks against the DNS infrastructure, being able to minimize the fallout of those attacks and still allow your application to be delivered to end users as requested. And even, you know, scaling DNS. So things like, um, you know, uh, DNSSEC, for instance, the DNS security, the, 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 um, having that chain of trust all the way down from, from the top level domains, the dot com, the dot org to, to the servers within the ISP, the DNS responders, all the way down to your, uh, own DNS servers, um, yourself. So sometimes that's hard, you know, the, the DNS name and IP address Oftentimes needs to match. It's a it's a one to one potentially scenario, and and things like that DNS uh, DNS sec might not work well because you have to match the DNS name to the IP address. But in a global distributed infrastructure, that name and number match might not be the same. That IP address may change depending upon where the application is being delivered from. And so being able to you know scale out and deliver your apps no matter where the request comes from, and also stopping those malicious attacks no matter where they're coming from. Oh, I kind of spoke a little bit about this, um, you know, a few slides back. Uh, cluster multiprocessing is just the ability to um, spread out resources efficiently and appropriately depending upon your needs. And you can see here in, in this graph how uh, GN, GTM certainly scales and, you know, really no matter how many queries they may, there may be out there. We talked a little bit about the uh, DNS Express being the authoritative DNS in memory. And so really what it's about is um, – which are the DNS queries that need to be answered? That's sort of one of the ways that, you know, kind of look at it. So it's, it's really offloading um, some of that horsepower, some of that processing power required from the DNS servers right down to um, the GTM, the DNS Express and TMOS, and have that take care of those sorts of queries and only go back to DNS when absolutely necessary. Hmm. And then the uh, Anycast integration, you know, obscures DNS servers, distributes load. You know, that's one of the things even just big IP devices in general is cloaking the application. One of the ways that malicious users uh, try to gain access to the applications themselves is by understanding the application. Is And it's not understanding the necessarily the application logic, but what is it running? Is it running Apache? Is it running IIS? Um, what type of application is it running on that particular platform? And retrieving that information initially can help a malicious user or a hacker. Um, I like to say malicious hacker or, or malevolent hacker instead of just hackers because, um, you know, as security folks, the, the term hacker has kind of gotten a bad rap over time, particularly in the media. You know, they're they're... They're black hats and they're white hats, and, you know, a hack is simply either a way to make things work better or, you know, uncovering a vulnerability to make things more secure. So that's why I, I tend to quantify hackers with malicious, malevolent, and, you know, dastardly, riffraff, whatever. And so getting back to the story, um, what, if I figure out the fact that it's running, you know, Apache, or, you know, running this particular, you know, version of bind for DNS. And I know that particular version of Apache bind, whatever, has specific certain vulnerabilities. Well, then I can target my attack. I can say, oh, I don't have to worry about all the IIS stuff. I'm just going to focus in on Apache, and these are the latest uh, holes that were found. I'm going to look for those. So being able to obscure, to uh, hide that particular information from end users, whether they're malicious or not, 
kind of help, also helps protect your infrastructure. I have no idea what they're running on the back end. What you know? How am I going to figure this out? I have no idea. It's going to take me longer to figure out. It's going to take more time, more energy, more money to try to break into this system. You know what? I don't need that. I can go on to the next one because I know I'll find one that's, you know, open and I'll know everything about it. That's kind of um, sort of important to obscure all that stuff. And I, this is, you know, kind of the whole um, summary slide for the DDoS attack mitigation. So being able to DNS offload the DNS Express, uh, distribute um, the request to the nearest data center, really the nearest GTM, to let that then make the decision on which data center to best deploy in the IP Anycast. Uh, officially, they say, there's this one website, I can't remember the name, but the IP4 addresses, so all this year, oh, yeah, we finally run out of IP4. Oh, you know, there was IPv6 day earlier this year. There's this one website that actually says something like April 12th, April 14th, maybe 2012, is when they see the, the actual full-on depletion of V4 addresses. And so a number of companies out there are deploying V6, kind of because they have to. Um, but so there's, you know, probably over the next couple of years, there's going to be a, a, a huge need for this, you know, V6 to V4 translation services and gateways. And we already have that built into our devices, the V6 and V4 uh, translation services to be able to run that in, in hybrid environments, whether the clients on V4 and and back end V6, clients on V6, back end V4, or even your infrastructure itself. You've split it up. You're starting that migration process. You have you know part of it on V6, part of it on V4. We're still able to distribute that traffic appropriately. And then in any global environment, high performance data center cloud, you need the scale, flexible performance, and also have it be cost effective. Um, talking a lot about consolidation and costs and expenses, CapEx, OpEx, all that type of um, things companies need to worry about. So being cost effective and also as virtualization cloud continues to grow, um, having those virtual additions available both for the development and testing phase but also deploying those same policies, those same configurations out there in the cloud when those applications swing to the cloud for delivery is also critical, in a, in, in, and particularly in a dynamic data center, in a dynamic infrastructure that delivers resources based on context, based on identity, based on what is happening right there and then at the time and what's the best way to, to um, answer that request. And so you can see at any layer, really, of the OSI model, um, we offer protection in, in all of our varying devices. I was learning the OSI model. There used to be one of those uh, little sayings that you can remember are all seven layers. I just can't remember it now because I know the layers, but I remember 15, 20 years ago, like, trying to memorize the OSI model and one of those, you know, silly word games that you play to remember the AP, the, 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 the DP, yeah. So with any version release, we certainly create a number of, um, a lot of content and a lot of resources to help not only our customers, our potential opportunities, our partners, our end users really understand uh, what version 11 means and what are all of the new services Available. If I could recommend, though, that application security in the cloud with Big IP ASM is pretty darn good because I wrote it. Um, but the rest of them, obviously, are, are really good. Actually, the high-performance DNS services is uh, getting a lot of reads. People seem to be extremely interested in that in addition to the security JSON and AJAX messages. You can certainly visit our Dev Central site. I have a blog on Dev Central, a number of our uh, technical marketing team right on Death Central. It's our community of, of employees and users sharing ideas, sharing experiences. It's really a, a, a social media site for Big IP. And then from, you know, uh, from F5.com, you can get whatever the product sheets, data sheets, white papers, you know, all the varying materials that uh, you may need to, need to look for or want to read when um, 
when learning about version 11 if if this particular series hasn't hasn't sufficed. So in summary, we're getting down a couple slides to go. As we started at the top, we wanted to talk about Web 2.0 applications that Ajax um, and also the JSON delivery method covered that. The unified access control doesn't matter who, what, where, when, and how they're coming, consolidating those onto a, a single big IP and having that, that intelligence built in to determine how best to deliver those resources no matter who the user is. And then protecting that most basic part of the Internet, DNS, that, that first step in requesting anything on the Internet, particularly web applications, that name the number resolution that happens every time we type something in to our browser. And then the big question mark. Do you have any questions? Oh, we got the QA. We got quite a few questions on Q&A here. But let's, let's um, have the operator open it up for audio questions in the meantime. Operator? Thank you, sir. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one. To cancel your request, press star two. One moment, please, for the first question. Uh, yeah, no, as, as the first question comes in, so over the uh, IM within a live meeting, the first question is, uh, can those slides be emailed to us? And if I remember, Tools, this is recorded, and then we'll make the, the recording and presentation available afterwards? Co correct. So um, the recording will be available maybe in a week's time, but um, if, if anyone is interested in, the, in a copy of the slide deck, just send me an email to the email address that you see on the screen now. Uh, that's my address, and um, I will send you the PowerPoint. All right, so I'm just uh, writing in the uh, answer as we continue on here. So the, the next question see who, from uh, Holger, Holger Kohn, hopefully I pronounced that properly. The main security benefits of version 11. Well, oh, boy. It's kind of, kind of um, for me personally, I think some of the main security benefits really is that um, is the AJAX, the JSON protection. That's pretty critical, uh, especially as, as more JSON deployments and more AJAX is being used on the web. Certainly the, the virtual addition of ASM being available so that you can have that same protection in the cloud, that's one of been, that's, that's at least been reported as to one of the hindrances of adoption is the security in the cloud and, and the fears of the unknown. And again, that's just human nature. We, we, you know, we, we, we fear change. We are uncomfortable losing control of things. And when those things move to the cloud, it's not only the, the security of the assets, but it's our own kind of, you know, belly security because it's changed, because we don't have control, because it's out of our hands, because we can't walk down the hallway and, and hug that server. So the virtual edition being available. Um, and then, I, you know, certainly I think the enhancements uh, we made for uh, end-user access, uh, those security benefits that are, you know, now built into Edge Gateway and Access Policy Manager will probably be, you know, the top things. I could say DNS Express, too, because of the DNS. I mean, the, a lot of varying critical security benefits of version 11. Uh, let's see. Next question from Alex Greenwood. Do you know if the .gov.uk and .ac.uk zones have been signed as they're uh, not homolet controlled, but Janet controlled? I've, so you uh thinking you mean signed as in DNS signing. I'm not do you know tools if gov.uk I don't actually no. Get back uh well that. um so any question we don't have the answer to, I'll try to um make a quick note, save it, and um get back get back to you on that one. Uh let's see, the next one comes from Graham. Lightbody, any plans to offer integration into other VM products? Uh, I really can't uh, talk roadmap 
Um, I'm not. I, I'm within the product management part of marketing organization, but I'm not the product manager for the product. But what I can say is, of, of course, certainly we are looking at other VM solutions to integrate with. Currently, our virtual editions. If that, if if this is the question you're asking, our our virtual editions will run on um, VMware uh, version four, I believe. And so, yeah, certainly we're looking at other other VM solutions to run our code on because not you know not every Cloud hoster. Not every every company out there runs VMware. They are they're varying other VM solutions. Now we certainly do have integration. If say you're talking VDI integration, we can certainly integrate with any you know the uh, VMware's VDI solution, Citrix's VDI solution, any of those the VDI solutions out there. We can certainly yeah vulnerability management integrate with. Um, and, uh, oh, vulnerability management. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, we're always looking at, you know, partnering with the, with the right, you know, provider with the right solution. Say, for instance, you know, our White Hat partnership and integration. We're, we are certainly always exploring various ways to, to ensure that, um, the applications and the end users that are requesting those applications are, are protected from, you know, vulnerabilities. Uh, but I, I don't have any names offhand that I can share. The next one, uh, Syed Akhtar Ghazi. We use connection reaping on LTM to tackle DDoS on DNS servers at one of our customers' site. And we're, oh, cool. Quite successful. What additional benefits will we have by placing ASM? So, um, so it's great to hear that the uh, you know the connection reaping on LT LTM handles the DDoS. Yes, absolutely on the DNS. So the additional benefits by adding application security manager. So again, the LTM can certainly protect against the, those uh, network-based attacks, the you know layer three, layer four type attacks, where ASM is is specifically built to protect against the layer seven type attacks, the, the SQL injections, the forceful browsing, the cross-site request forgeries, uh, slow loris, um, you know, the, the, the anything listed in the OWASP top 10, that would kind of be the differentiator, the, the ASM specifically to layer 7, specifically protecting uh, application logic and application vulnerabilities, application layer attacks through the browser. LTM, uh, you know, it's a, it's out of the box deny all, and it really it, it, the administrator has to set it up to say allow this, allow that, and that would be more on the network layer. Hopefully, I answered that question. Let's see, from Andreas Zettelman, what what's the speed comparison ratio? Ratio, maybe it's ratio between DNS Express and regular DNS deployments? Um, is, I, maybe I don't understand fully the question. Is it that slide that showed the 10 times? I think uh, he's probably just asking what the speed improvement is compared to, to traditional DNS solutions when you use DNS Express performance gains. Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've played out, you know, the 10 times. Hmm. Um, it could probably vary, you know, depending upon, you know, the amount of queries and, and what is actually going on. So I guess regular DNS deployments, um, you know, if there's no attack, it probably just handles the queries much faster because it's deli being delivered out of cache. It's being delivered from, from GTM, from that, from that initial responder versus going back to an infrastructure. And that's certainly, if in fact an attack is occurring, um, regular DNS deployments would probably, you know, crumble under the pressure where the DNS Express, as we mentioned, um, you know, will block those those malicious type of requests and only let the good ones through. Yeah, he, he Andreas qualified oh, that. Yeah. Gotcha. Thanks, thanks for the uh, update through the um, through the IM. And sorry, I wasn't trying to ignore anybody on the call, but do we have any um, any uh, 
verbal questions <laughs> rather than written. We are showing no questions at this time, sir. Beautiful. Okay, I think we we got through the list, didn't we, um, Peter? Yeah, you know, I do appreciate everyone's uh, time this afternoon, and uh, hopefully this is you know, fun, interesting. It certainly was for me. It's uh, it's eight o'clock, and I feel actually quite energized. <laughs> Give me another six hours. So, I do, do appreciate your time. Um, again, uh, my name is Peter. Come visit us online. Read my blog on Dev Central. If you have any question, tools, email is there, and if uh, if they need to get routed back to me, I'm happy to answer them. So we really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. So thank, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar, and um, have a great evening.